The Ghost of Hank Jones, written by Charlie Kasoff, narrated by Caitlin Bailey. Hank Jones built a house in the woods. Then he filled his three acres with carports, sheds, and garages. And then he filled the rest of his years, filling those with errs. Hank owned so many errs. Leaf blowers, snow blowers, lawn mowers, weed whackers, flamethrowers, screwdrivers, bolt cutters, boat trailers. In between the Ur containment structures, he'd filled his land with just one kind of Ur. Litter. Rusted out pickup trucks, boats, decorative wood stoves, and eagles. The man had a thing for eagles. Thirty-five years in the Navy had given him a love of the all-American bird of prey, and thirty-five years in retirement had given him time to rewild his land with eagle stickers, statues, and stained glass. When Hank finally passed away, his daughter put his house on the market. She sold it as is for a discount and expected the buyers either to get rid of the junk themselves or luxuriate in it as her father seemed to. When Sasha and Madison Palomino first moved into Hank's home, they recognized the small, oxidized copper eagle affixed to a wind chime next to the front door, along with the painted wooden bird hanging above the garage, wide and flat as though it had been run over by an 18-wheeler. They clocked the birds at the open house and again during their walkthrough with the realtor, but as they took a victory lap around the perimeter of their new property, What had seemed to Madison to be a mushroom growing perpendicular to a sugar maple turned out, on closer inspection, to be a wrought iron raptor bolted into the bark. From then on, the couple kept a running tally of eagles found. It became a kind of scavenger hunt, a benchmark for how familiar they'd grown with their land. By the time the tally reached 18, they began to suspect they were living in an airy. They were fascinated by the eagles. Quick to unpack the political import of everything, the Palominos wondered why Hank had so many eagles, yet only one, albeit large, American flag. If you were an eagle guy, wouldn't you also be a flag guy? Where were the cracked wood pallets, thinly painted red, white, and blue, tilting against the sheds? Where was the star-spangled air freshener hanging from the rearview mirror of the old pickup truck? stinking up the car with freedom? Where were the beer koozies emblazoned with the slogan, these colors don't run, strewn about the workbench in the garage, still hugging empty Budweiser's? As time went on, the best explanation the couple could come up with for this discrepancy was that birds and flags served two distinct purposes. Hank's single, high-flying stars and stripes was all he needed to signal that he was a member of the sociopolitical herd of the United States. An eagle statue, poking its beak out from an overgrown barberry bush, or a stained-glass eagle with a menacing stare and a freshly caught trout in its talons, reminded Hank that he was a goddamn American apex predator. He might have fancied himself a predator, but his junkyard acreage led the Palominos to a different conclusion. Old Hank had been just another cranky conservative who refused to accept change. He was as likely to part with his rusty rototiller as he was to stop calling waitresses sweetheart. And so, Sasha and Madison had moved up to rural Hiram from Ridgewood, Queens, to find themselves surrounded by rusting, inanimate errs. In the city, they'd gotten used to living, breathing errs. Painters, lawyers, teachers, designers, brokers, traders, and waiters, all filling up the city's err containment structures, traveling from concrete cubes via aluminum tubes to steel and glass obelisks. Even the Palominos themselves were errs. Sasha was a coder, a programmer, a software engineer. There was no way to describe his job without an err. Madison was an account manager in the philanthropic wing of a major investment bank. It was a mouthful of a description, but to her, it was an ideal job. She spent her days thinking about ways to help people, 
She didn't have to interact much with bankers, and she was paid handsomely for her time. But in the past year, she'd begun to wonder if there were better ways to administer philanthropy. She had friends who did grant writing for various nobly intentioned nonprofits. The work seemed fulfilling, but with their salaries, her friends were on the verge of needing charity themselves. She was often tempted to work in democratic politics. That was the only way to push for philanthropy as policy, as consistent and continuous redistribution, as economic justice, and not merely as a way for rich people to pick and choose how to purge guilt over their resource hoarding. But every time she looked into it, she was reminded of the downsides, the long hours, the middling pay, and the upward career trajectory that might require her to move to Washington, D.C., a tragic geographic fate. So she resigned herself to stay at her job and vote for the furthest left candidate running in every primary and general election. Then, Sasha pointed out that maybe their liberal votes could make more of an impact elsewhere. There were whole swaths of upstate New York long dominated by Republicans, but beginning to turn blue. If the Palominos moved somewhere that was purpling and started a family there, they could contribute to a generational shift. In the short term, she and Sasha would keep their city jobs and telecommute from Hiram until they built their nest egg back up. Then, after a few years, they'd open a business, something that served the area but also made it enticing for more like-minded folk to move up from the city, something that blended in with the scenery but still offered an element of novelty and fun, either a hybrid bar and classic video game arcade or a board game cafe. Until then, they'd make themselves welcome in the community by patronizing businesses and not being patronizing while they did so. The first business they patronized was a junk removal service. It handled the biggers, while the Palominos spent weekend mornings rounding up the scattered smallers, often hauling them to the county dump themselves. Over a few months, the junk went from dominating the landscape to dotting it. The sheds and carports no longer spilled over with rusty errs. The grass began to grow again in spots kept shaded for decades by trucks and boats. They took down the jumbo-sized American flag. The more ostentatious the display of patriotism, the emptier it felt to them. The only statement they wanted to express was their wish to blend in with the scenery. But Madison could never bring herself to throw away a single eagle. When she was wrestling with a jammed garage door and knocked the wooden bird off its hook above her, snapping its wing on the concrete stoop, even then, she wouldn't toss it. Instead, she picked up some wood glue from Travis Hardware, repaired the eagle, and returned it to its perch. The eagles, now lonely and prominent, became totems of Hank. If Hank's junkyard evoked his stubborn old man ways, his eagles evoked the soaring spirit of a bygone generation. And without the accompanying American flag, the eagles didn't remind Madison of America's complicated history. Everyone who had ever lived on this soil had revered the eagle. Indigenous Americans believed it was a messenger to their creator. And now, it was Madison's turn. One day, Madison hauled out yet another piece of discarded electronic equipment, an inkjet printer this time, from the ravine at the edge of the property and tossed it onto the junk heap she'd been amassing under the shot ear of the two carports. She looked up at the seven-inch brushed steel eagle affixed to the wooden rafter, broadcasting its violent scowl and perpetuity, when the thought occurred to her. What if the eagles weren't merely totems of Hank? What if they housed his eternal soul? The idea was ludicrous, of course, yet it was also thrilling. Her senses sharpened. The wind felt damper against her skin. Individual leaves came into focus amid the usual blur of foliage. The din of daytime crickets, birds, and rustling rodents normally tuned out by her ears now deafened. Madison was a young woman alone in the woods. All that was missing was an ethereal voice in the wind urgently whispering, get out or leave. She was startled by a roar as Sasha emerged from the garage with a working leaf blower. 
After consulting YouTube on how to replace the deformed plug on Hank's old one, he'd been in the garage for almost three hours trying to apply what he'd learned. You fixed it, Squee? Madison yelled over to him. Yeah, Squee, Sashi yelled back, affecting the Michigan accent he used when his mood was light. In the past two years, their pet name for each other had become Squee in honor of Brett Kavanaugh's infamous high school drinking buddy. They'd watch Kavanaugh's confirmation hearing with pits in their stomachs and angry tears in their eyes. They'd watched his accuser's story be dismissed on national television, her trauma discounted. That someone could be nominated to the highest court in the land and also have consorted with someone named Squee was beyond incongruous. In those trying days, they began calling each other Squee, ironically at first. But the word's phonetic ease made its use habitual. As the blue wave in the next month's election healed some of the pain of the Kavanaugh travesty, Squee shed its upsetting context and only sparked joy. That's great, Squee, Madison yelled back. Guess what? What? Sasha was now only a few feet away from her, so she motioned towards the eagle. I just realized we're living in the plot of a horror movie. Old Hank's souls trapped in them their eagles. Sasha flashed a smile that only grew as he worked the scenario out in his mind. He chuckled and offered his trademark dry response. Totally. A warm feeling forced Madison to smile, too. She loved when Sasha appreciated her sense of humor. Too many of her friends had ended up with guys who were fine with their wives out-earning them, who believed in co-parenting and taking paternity leave, but who couldn't abide not being the funny one in the relationship. Her friend Talia was case in point. She'd always been a riot, ready to undress someone with a cheeky barb or keep a joke going in absurd directions. But ever since she started dating Peter, she'd become more self-conscious. When Talia would jump in on a group joke, Peter would study her as though she were auditioning to be a contributor of humor. Others might laugh at her joke, but then Peter would flatly state, That's funny, babe. Then Talia would squirm and lose confidence in her future joke telling. Madison had sworn to herself that if Sasha ever did that to her in public, the countdown to divorce would begin. So are we in a slasher flit? Sasha asked or a demonic awakening. My guess is if we throw out some combination of the eagles, we release Hank's spirit and he terrorizes us. I count that as demonic awakening, Sasha said, with a side of like classic ghost haunting. Do you think he comes back as an invisible force or would he reanimate his corpse and we get fucked up by zombie Hank? I don't know, Madison said, but I think we should call in the paranormal expert now so they at least have a case file ready for when we're actually under attack. The idea stayed fresh for months, growing and evolving as new possibilities were explored, tender to be spent whenever there was a lull in conversation or when they wanted to give city friends an exciting reason to visit. Eventually, the ironic enjoyment went stale. Madison no longer felt like she was living inside a horror movie, but rather she was living inside one of those postmodern horror movies in which the characters are aware they're living inside one and all the dialogue centers around genre rules. That realization made the exercise with Sasha feel like a chore. She grew sick of the joke and sick of the eagles. Horror movie or not, Madison resolved one morning to get rid of these eyesores. She discarded one after another, a small painted ceramic eagle nestled between a rhododendron and an azalea bush, the wooden bird above the garage whose wings she'd repaired, the oxidized copper one next to the front door. Committing the act that might awaken Hank's demon, or summon his ghost, or reanimate his corpse, made the joke fun again. Every time Madison tossed another bird into the junk heap, she and Sasha made sober acknowledgement of the impending onset of their cinematic doom. 
one of them would call out to Hank with a preemptive apology for disrupting his eternal slumber. Sasha would tell Madison it had been nice knowing her and that he'd always loved her. All that remained now was the brushed steel eagle affixed to the carport. As much as she knew nothing would actually happen if she did, she couldn't bring herself to take it down. It was superstitious thinking, but according to an NPR Talk of the Nation episode she'd listened to, superstitions were mostly harmless. It might be embarrassing explaining to Sasha why she couldn't throw away the last eagle, but it would be nothing compared to the embarrassment she'd feel if she ended up being terrorized by a right-wing demon. Besides, she thought, Sasha would understand. He'd listen to the same NPR episode. Sasha and Madison loved hosting two couples at a time. Two couples were easier than one, for they could keep each other entertained while Sasha and Madison executed hosting tasks. It was easier, that is, so long as those two couples got along. Zan and Kelly and Peter and Talia got along, for now at least. Zan and Kelly loved Peter, who always made sure to put on one of his one of the good straights is male performances around queer couples. Madison assumed it was only a matter of time before Kelly, the more perceptive of her and Zan, would get wise to how Peter was slowly crushing Talia's spirit. Then they'd cancel Peter, quietly, of course. There'd be no more group hangs. Every invitation to Zan and Kelly would be met with a lengthy explanation of why they were a maybe, followed by a tactful probing of who else had been invited. If Peter and Talia weren't mentioned, then a few days later, Zan and Kelly would announce that their other plans had fallen through and that they were now free to visit. But for now, the six of them all got along famously, and they were about to spend a weekend together. At the sight of a boxy white sedan with Arizona plates rolling down the driveway, Sasha and Madison came out to greet their city slicker guests in their rental car. I want to see the eagles, Zan said, once hugs and salutations had been exchanged and before luggage could be brought inside the house. I think we talked them up too much, Sasha sighed. There's only one left. Ooh, Kelly said. Maybe we should take it down this weekend. See what happens. I may or may not have packed Kelly's tarot deck, Zan said, just in case. Sasha and Madison looked at each other. The acknowledgement of each other's trepidation collapsed into shared laughter. If anyone could make overcoming their superstition a pleasant experience, Madison thought, it was Zan, the self-appointed scissor sister of fun. Zan was the only person Madison knew who'd managed to have fun as a career. She worked on a team of ghostwriters for a major spy thriller franchise that had been translated into 20 languages. She never tired of the idea of suburban dads the world over not knowing that their beloved action hero, Ryan Forge, was puppeteered by a skater punk queer girl in a snapback. Sure, Madison said. Let's toss it. We needed to do a junkyard run anyway. Aw, oh, man, you go to a junkyard? Zan said. Oh, yeah, Sasha laughed. We're real country here. Okay, but the real question is, do y'all own more guns or more fishing rods? Kelly asked. Or do you just shoot the fish with your guns? Talia asked. While Zan and Kelly laughed and Sasha simulated the act of firing a rifle into the lake, Peter turned to Talia and flatly stated, That's funny, babe. Madison clocked Talia's deflation. Why was Talia letting Peter treat her like that, dismissing her humor with condescension in front of her own friends. The quick banter Talia had honed matching wits with her ninth grade biology students made her a welcome presence in any social configuration. Peter, aware of her comfort level in this group, acted as though he needed to knock her down in order to establish social dominance. It was obvious enough to Madison that this was happening, but subtle enough that if she wanted to call Peter out, Peter could plausibly deny it. But seriously, Talia said, did Hank leave you any guns? 
Well, Madison said, according to his daughter, Ol' Hank had quite the collection. But when he died, he left it all to the local fish and game club. That was just about the only junk he managed to get rid of, Sasha said. Well, Zan said, ain't that some country cousin kindness? Only if you spell country and cousin with a K, Peter said. Zan laughed and elbowed Peter in the ribs. He couldn't help but beam with pride. While Sasha brought everyone's bags inside, Madison gave her guests a tour of the property. Each time she pointed out where a bird statue or piece of junk had once lived, someone would joke about how fabulous, epic, or legendary Hank was for his design aesthetic. The hyperbolic language escalated. By the time they reached the lone eagle affixed to the carport, Hank had graduated from ghost to god. She's a beaut, Zan barked as she studied the eagle from every vantage point. Huh. Kelly said, giving the bird a tug. Looks like it's nailed in by each wing. Jesus Christ, Zan said. Literally, Talia said. Madison and Kelly laughed. Y'all, Peter said. Ol' Hank crucified that bird. Nail it's pretty deep in there, Kelly said, inspecting the right wing stigmata. How do we get it out? Give me one sec. Madison said. There's a crowbar in the garage. That is delightful, Kelly said as Madison walked away. What was delightful to Kelly was useful to Madison. She positioned herself under and just behind the eagle and wedged the crowbar between bird and beam. Zam started chanting ominous gibberish that was soon riffed on by the rest of the group, reminding Madison of the horror movie she was starring in. She paused, collected herself, and decided that this should be fun, at least for her guests. Hank Jones, Madison encanted. You're free now. May your soul fly as high as Laura Ingram's ratings. The nail in its right wing came out easily, and the bird swung down clockwise, hanging from its left. Madison wedged the crowbar under the remaining nail, then hesitated, wondering which horror movie trope would present itself. If she was about to pry open a hole in the barrier between the corporeal and ethereal planes of existence, she might feel a shockwave pass through her, or she might hear an urgent whisper in an alien tongue or the carport might collapse into a wormhole where the eagle had been? Or was that the type of trope that happened at the end of the movie? Zan raised her index finger slowly, upward and outward, conducting the chant to a manic crescendo. Madison jerked the crowbar. The bird landed in the dirt with a dampened thud. Oh, right, she thought. The anticlimactic trope. Hey, y'all, Sasha said as he approached his friends who were now helping Madison load the car with junk. I got a text from the electric company. Thunderstorms tonight. We might lose power. Maybe it'd be a good idea to stop by the hardware store and pick up some lanterns. A storm, Kelly asked. Oh, we are definitely doing a tarot card seance tonight. This is like so horror movie, Talia said. Plus... We get to see a real podunk hardware store, Peter said. Oh, you removed it, Sasha said, scooping up the eagle. Oh, crap. Sorry we didn't wait for you, Sash, Madison said. But don't worry, Kelly said. Hank's still going to kill you when he kills us. Oh, well, thank God for that, you know, Sasha said, then threw the bird in with the rest of the junk. After the trip to the junkyard, the Palominos took their guests to Jair's Wiener Cart, home of the Tornado Dog, a hot dog whose bun was lined with a hash of pulverized Cheetos and pickle relish, 
then doused in a secret hot sauce that Madison was convinced was just mustard with a dash of Tabasco. Everyone issued moans and declarations of disbelief as they inhaled Hiram's culinary claim to fame. This is kind of my jam, Zan said. Madison chuckled into her tornado dog. Ever since Sasha pointed out that kind of my jam was how millennials allowed themselves to be earnest without risking being vulnerable, she couldn't help but laugh when she heard it used. Hey, Maddie, Kelly said, watching Madison eat her last bite. Aren't you, like, paleo? What? No, Madison said, attempting to silence Kelly with her eyes. She was paleo. But Madison had concluded early on that of all the Hiram locals she'd met thus far, Jer was her most natural ally, and it was worth the weekly indulgence in his carb-heavy cooking to cultivate the friendship. An aging hippie who'd fled the city in the early 80s to erase the rat race pace, Jer seemed to have since declared a truce with capitalism. A gray ponytail, faded tie-dye t-shirt, and washed-out jeans covered most of his body's real estate, but a closer look revealed his brand new Gore-Tex hiking boots, which retailed at L.L. Bean for $250 a pair. Madison recognized the pigeon blue raglan sleeves of the fleece always tied around his waist from Patagonia's fall catalog. Madison had the same jacket in mulch brown. Hey, Jer, Madison said. Thanks for putting me in touch with Ezekiel. Happy to, Maddie. Did Zeke fix your leak? Yep. And he put insulating sleeves on an outdoor pipe. No charge. Zeke's a cool dude. Nice to know we have a reliable plumber now. I'm always glad to give those crooks at Copper Works some competition. That Jer had volunteered Ezekiel's name and number was no small kindness. Madison's realtor had warned her that honest repairmen were in such short supply around Hiram that when you found one, you were loath to share them. Madison felt like Jer treated her like she was the daughter he never had and Sasha, the first of Madison's boyfriends he actually approved of. Though that kind of paternalism was problematic, it was the very best Madison had come to expect from boomer men. Besides, Jer had a seat on Hiram's Chamber of Commerce. If he was willing to help Madison find a plumber, he'd probably be willing to grease some wheels when she was ready to open her board game cafe. That's going to give me one groovy heart attack. Peter said, smacking his lips as he finished his tornado dog. Hey, Jer, can I get a picture with you? Before Jer could consent, Peter already had one arm around him and was snapping a selfie with the other. Say peace, Peter said, squinting as though stoned out of his mind. He then inspected the photo. Jer, what's your Insta? I'll tag you. No Instagram for me. You should. Could really signal boost your brand, man. I'm happy with what I've got. So free, Peter said. Jer looked at Madison. She blanched. You brought this yuppie millennial here, he seemed to say with his glance. And I won't forget it. Nestled in a valley and dotted with discolored facades, the main street of Hiram sagged like an aging smile. As her friends walked along, Madison was keenly aware they were prowling for mockable prey. The general store was adorbs. The mere existence of a toy boat museum was amazing. Its backdrop good for a few selfies. Pam's unisex salon prompted Kelly to ask Madison in a brash redneck voice, Do you want the Rachel or the Karen? Madison laughed weakly. She still drove back to the city to get her hair cut by someone she could trust to pull off a sleek look, but eventually she'd have to let Pam cut her hair. In small towns, the hairdresser knew everyone. Pam would be an important ally. After each guest had their turn snapping selfies in front of Geist Pillar's pharmacy, whose window display touted Christian wellness products, Zan announced they had to investigate, which Peter promptly seconded. Y'all go in, Madison said. Sasha and I'll wait out here. 
Once her friends were safely inside and out of earshot, she turned to Sasha and said, I want to go home. What's wrong, Squee? I feel like I'm leading a safari tour. Sasha chuckled, then sighed. I, I mean, maybe the novelty's worn off for us, but like, this is their first time up here. I get it. But at least you and I know how to be discreet. It's one thing for us to have a few laughs about Hank Jones on our property, but are friends making fun of Jer to his face? I'm sure Jer's used to obnoxious tourists. This isn't the city, Sasha. These people aren't bombarded with social interaction here. They have all the time in the world to dwell on every encounter. If someone is condescending to them, they don't forget it so easily. So by way of you were catastrophizing, Peter was being extra, and now Jer is going to use his influence to sabotage our board game cafe? Madison wanted to unload on Sasha. Had he ever considered how much thought she'd put into cultivating a friendship with Jer? She hadn't simply omitted she was paleo. She planned to shade in her biography a bit more with every trip to Jer's cart as she sensed mutual trust growing. She'd even kept a spreadsheet to track her progress. Then Peter had gone and blown up that embryonic trust, and now Sasha was being dismissive. I am saying, Madison said, it upsets me that our friends know we want to lay down roots, and yet they're still pointing and gawking at our neighbors. It makes me uncomfortable. And until we've established ourselves a little more, I'd like to not be associated with them if they're going to behave this way. Sasha worked through her emotional testimony like he was reviewing a co-worker's code. She huffed a sigh from her nostrils. That's fair, Sasha said quickly, snapping out of his reverie. Can you run over to the hardware store before they come out? I really don't want to deal with Mr. Travis right now, and I really don't want to deal with everyone meeting him. Oh, of course, Squee, Sasha said, then kissed her forehead. I'll try to be quick. He was four storefronts away when the bells on the pharmacy door chimed. Did you know that Jesus probably used CBD lotion? Peter said. The Bible implies it. Hey! Zan said, peering down the street. Where's Sasha going? Oh, he went to the hardware store, Madison said. He'll be back in a minute. Let's just wait for him in the car. Madison, Zan said, deathly serious. Do not stand between a queer woman and a display of power tools. That's just homophobic. Madison stayed put near the front of Travis Hardware, watching her guests fan out across the aisles. She could never decide if Travis was the proprietor's first or last name. If it was his first name, it was missing an apostrophe. She'd never asked. The man who stood behind the counter looked like the owner, and he didn't look like he wanted to debate possessive nouns any more than he'd be willing to use someone's preferred pronouns. He was a redneck without a doubt, but his quiet, controlled demeanor unnerved her. She was more comfortable living with the straw rednecks in her mind, closer to Yosemite Sam than to the Marlboro Man. She and Sasha had only been in the hardware store once prior, and Travis, or Mr. Travis, devastated their neighborly overtures with curtness. He struck Madison as yet another one of those bigoted white people following the same rhythm in his assessment of the couple. He squinted at Sasha, who was one quarter Filipino, as if reckoning which shithole country he'd come from. Then he looked at Madison, disappointed that this all-American girl had gone to waste on an ethnic man. She'd never brought it up with Sasha. She didn't need to. Travis's or... Mr. Travis's curtness alone had left them happy to drive to a pleasant mom-and-pop hardware shop a few towns over. Sasha scanned the aisles with purpose, looking for batteries and lanterns. Zan and Peter found themselves in the hunting aisle. Kelly and Talia perused the corner with the fishing gear. Ooh, Peter yelled. 
This one's perfect for home protection. Yep. Zan yelled back. Nothing says, get off my land like a pump action shotgun. Now that Zan and Peter were performing for the entire store, Kelly and Talia moved to nab front row seats. Madison scanned the store, hoping to catch Sasha's eye over the low aisle dividers. But Sasha was probably crouched down, meticulously comparing the specs of two lanterns he would only use once a year. Madison made her way to the door. If she waited outside, she could at least pretend like she wasn't a part of it. Hey, Maddie, Zan yelled. Madison stopped between the checkout counter and the exit. Can we get you this as a housewarming gift? Madison knew she was trapped in their act now. I'll think about it. Think? Peter yelled. There's never a need to think when it comes to guns. Yeah, what would old Hank Jones say if he knew you weren't packing heat in his house? Zan yelled. I hear you, but I, I, uh, gotta act fast, Maddie, Talia yelled. There won't be much hunting to do once you've got all the libs to build condos in the woods. Unless you want to hunt libs for sport, Peter yelled. Zan started blowing on a duck whistle. Sasha reappeared and approached the checkout, cradling three lanterns, all different brands, along with a 24-pack of D batteries. His eyes widened when they met Madison's. She knew that look. Let's get the fuck out of here. She nodded and took a stealing breath. Moments like these let her know what parenting with Sasha would be like. In those moments when she'd feel beleaguered by screaming children, she could know there was someone she was in this together with. Of course, children were a ceaseless challenge. Unself-aware yuppie house guests would be gone by Sunday. As Travis, or Mr. Travis, rang Sasha up, Madison felt free to study the proprietor without him studying her back. She hadn't noticed before how much thought he put into his self-presentation. Probably, she thought, because this wasn't what would pass for self-presentation in the city. His flannel was pressed and tucked evenly into his boxy blue jeans. His mustache was full and cut evenly above his lip, and his hair was combed perfectly at its natural part. The only loud sartorial choice was his bronze eagle belt buckle. What was it with these men and their eagles? Around him were photos laminated and taped to the counter and cash register. There were photos of him and another man and an upside-down deer, him and another man and a massive fish. Most of the pictures were of him and a different man and a different kill. On the wood-paneled wall behind him hung a framed photo of 20-some-odd men and their fishing poles, standing in curved rows like a church choir behind a short, wide barrel of freshly caught fish. All the men wore the same green and orange trucker hats. A fishing club. Madison's mind entered the reality inside that picture and thought about all the problematic things these men would probably have to say about race and class and gender. How unsafe she would feel to be there alone with them and how invisible she'd be made to feel if she were there with Sasha. She pictured them sitting around their lodge with Fox News playing in the background, keying them up about the culture war. God only knew what conspiracy memes they shared on Facebook. But there was also a twinge of envy. She remembered listening to an NPR podcast about how America's strength had always been in its local institutions, its community organizations, clubs, and leagues. At least this man had a sense of community. How many times had Madison signed up for a book club only to bail after the first or second meeting? Duck! Dynasty! Zan yelled, then blew her duck whistle. Die, nasty duck, Peter yelled back, pumping his shotgun. Did you just call my girlfriend a nasty dyke? Kelly yelled. Oh, you are so canceled, Peter. Sorry, Madison said. They're not from around here. Travis, or Mr. Travis, didn't look at her as he bagged the batteries. Will that be all?
Storm clouds spilled over the mountains southwest of Hiram, dividing the valley into two different worlds. As the six drove back to the Palomino's house, the blue sky ahead seemed to slip backwards into a dark, aerial pit. Tear tonight's gonna be lit, Zan said. No one says lit anymore, babe, Kelly said. I'm not trying to perform my jargon savviness on Twitter. I'm with six people in a station wagon. Colloquial. What? I think you mean colloquial savviness, babe, not jargon. Whatever. Basically the same thing. Except it's not. Words matter. Oh, man, Peter said. Lesbian linguistic fights are lit. That's really fucked up, Peter, Zan said. Madison's throat tightened. Zan didn't sound like she was joking. An awkward fire was burning up all the oxygen in the cramped car. Peter had actually crossed a line. Zan, I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to offend. I, I'm so rooting for the success of lesbian relationships and all queer relationships. And I, I actually really do believe that statistically speaking, they're healthier than straight relation. I'm fucking with you, Zan said. But it's good to see just how guilty you feel, my son. What do you say, Zan? Kelly chimed in. Five Hail Marys and ten rosaries and our boy here won't go to cis hetero hell? Peter laughed, but with far less enthusiasm than before. Madison watched him through her side mirror and couldn't help but smile. It was oddly invigorating to see him on his back foot uncomfortable. She couldn't see Talia, but assumed Talia was equally tickled. Unless, of course, Talia had so internalized Peter's dominant role that a blow to his ego was a blow to hers. Fuck Peter, Madison thought. I'll bet that guy at the hardware store starts saying lit in like 20 years, Sasha said, his eyes and hands steady on the road and wheel. Yup, Kelly said. Right around the time he figures out what LOL means, Talia said. Or LMAO, Peter added. Madison was so relieved that Sasha had broken the tension among the group that she was willing to forgive Peter for one-upping his girlfriend's joke. She liked when Sasha was attuned to social dynamics and when he could take charge without dominating. Later that night, she'd tell him that what he'd done was kind of hot. He liked when she said things he did were kind of hot. She thought it was silly, but it would be petty to shame him for so minor a kink. Nah, Madison said. I bet he already learned that word from Tucker Carlson. Tucker probably connected people who say lit with anarchists who set police precincts on fire, Zan said. What a fucking Nazi, Kelly said in her stuck-up mean girl voice. You know who would have loved the word lit? Peter asked. My man, Hank Jones. Do you think old Hank was the jolly old man type who knew he sounded dorky when he used his grandkids slang, but did it anyway? Sasha asked. Well, Kelly said, we can settle this for sure when we ask him tonight. Madison and Sasha had bought 12 different bottles of Malbec for the weekend. Buying 12 different bottles achieved several goals. Comparing wines would make for lively conversation. Determining which was the most popular would give Madison an easy go-to for future purchases. And of course, wine made people drunk. The first Malbec paired with food prep. Madison and Sasha were a formidable unit in the kitchen, but they also knew how to delegate tasks among a larger staff. While Sasha sliced and salted the eggplant, Peter was put on tomato sauce duty. Talia chopped veggies for salad, Zan grated mozzarella and parmesan, and Madison taught Kelly how to make cassava noodles from scratch. What kind of meal doesn't have any meat in it? Talia asked in a Texan drawl. There's egg in the pasta dough, Shug. Madison said, attempting the affectionate voice of a Southern belle. Uh, you're doing Hank Hill, not Hank Jones, babe. 
Peter said to Talia. And how would you know there's a difference? Madison snapped at Peter, though still using her Southern Belle voice. Call me crazy, but I don't think you've ever heard all Hank Jones speak, Shug. Peter's eyes widened. He dropped his ladle on the spoon rest, splattering sauce on the stovetop, and walked off to check his phone. Talia moved to clean it up, but Madison was faster to the sponge. With the sauce simmering, the eggplant leaching out its water, and the fresh pasta dough resting, the second Malbuck paired with 30 minutes of downtime. While the group debated the relative drinkability of the two bottles, and the patter of a steady rain could be heard on the roof, Madison snuck off to the bathroom. She had to get away from Peter. She knew she couldn't hide out the whole weekend, but keeping her guard up around him for another 36 hours would be emotionally draining. Maybe the group could stage an intervention at some point. If Madison could persuade Zan to broach the idea, Peter would be game. A woman who categorically would not fuck him was his thought leader. He'd balk if it was Madison's idea. A woman who fucked men but didn't fuck him was a non-entity. Aside from a pro forma hug and greeting upon arrival, had he even spoken directly to Madison once yet that day? More often than not, these were the men educated progressive women were stuck with. It was probably better than the alternative. Men like old Hank Jones or Travis, or Mr. Travis, probably made no secret of what they believed were men and women's natural roles. Did she even want to meet the ghost of Hank Jones? She knew it was a ludicrous thought. Ghosts weren't real. But still... Wouldn't it be better just to not even think about toxic people like him? Here she was, considering never inviting Peter back into her home. Why would she want an angry old redneck like Hank in it? Hey, Maddie, a voice yelled through the bathroom door. Did you fall in or something? It was Talia. Joking about Madison needing help was really her cry for help. Now that Madison had stood up for her in front of Peter... Talia needed Madison. The third Malbec paired with the rest of dinner prep, and bottles four and five went with the meal itself. Heavy rain had begun during dinner, and the wind whistled around the house as they sat around the dining room table before empty plates and salad bowls. When Madison removed the cork from bottle number six, the power went out. Reflexive screams were followed by gleeful hoots and hollers, and then by cell phone flashlights bouncing off of squinting faces until the chaos was cut off by the harsh glare of Sasha's lanterns. Of course he'd stash them under his chair to have at the ready, Madison thought. Okay, kiddos, Kelly said, using a lantern to uplight her face. Y'all know what time it is? It's tarot time. Kelly managed social media content for a bone broth startup called Bully On. She enjoyed being good at her job, but came home every day with her spirit flattened from so much trafficking in the 2D world. Though she started reading tarot for fun, it had become more than that. It was a tonic, a means of engaging in an intimate experience with another human being in an analog, physical space. She burned sage to fill her nostrils, coat her tongue, and clear her mind. She shuffled the large, heavy deck flush with wisdom and omen. She made invigorating eye contact as she grappled with life's big questions. At least, that was what Madison had inferred when Kelly once told her, I love it. I get to talk about real shit. Madison's own feelings on tarot had always been more equivocal. She never sought out a reading, but she could enjoy herself when her friends wanted to do one. Sasha had once called it a self-help card game, and she found herself charmed by his snarky witticism, enough to adopt his view as her own. As the charm wore off, she realized his joke was the kind of reductive, sick burn that would earn him a life-affirming number of upvotes in one of his subreddit haunts, but it didn't hold up to scrutiny. What was so bad about gamifying self-help? Getting people to be emotionally honest with each other was hard. With its immersive ritual, its element of chance, its cards steeped in some vague old-world tradition, 
tarot created favorable conditions for people to feel safely vulnerable. Madison loved games, but not everyone needed to be a peaceful means of sublimating the masculine urge to win. Damn, Maddie, your candle game is strong. Zan said as she wobbled the lantern up to the shelf holding five jar candles. With the power out, the group felt a tarot seance was best conducted by fickle, fuzzy candlelight than by unrelenting lantern. Black currant, butter rum, three lavender vanilla, the bougie. Kelly arranged the candles in a semicircle on the ottoman in the middle of the living room. Yielding upholstery surrounded by drunks was a precarious place to rest candles, Madison thought, but at the same time it added the perfect element of danger for summoning a ghost. The group sat around the ottoman, leaning against the bases of the couches and chairs, or cross-legged with their wine glasses in the space between ankles and crotch. Kelly had borrowed Madison's yoga blankets and sat tall on her knees atop them. Okay. Kelly said, shuffling the tarot deck. Who's got a question for old Hank? Hank, Zan chanted. Did you turn into an eagle? Do you and your ghost eagle friends watch Ghost Hannity all day? Talia asked. What kind of porn do you watch? Peter asked. Right on cue, Madison thought. Now that Peter was drunk, of course this was where he'd take the conversation as though compelled to make everyone else think about sex, too. Zan moaned like a ghost. Your mom's early work. Seriously, you guys, Kelly said, using a Valley Girl accent to hide what Madison knew was impatience. The tarot reader might purport to be a kind of spiritual medium, but she was still a performer and she wanted to own her time in the spotlight. Kelly turned to Madison and Sasha and said, Ask Hank something you really want to know. A distant thunderclap startled the group. Holy coyote! Zan yelled, now gripping Kelly's arm. Talia nuzzled against Peter, who embraced her without looking at her. This is like straight-up horror movie now, y'all, Kelly said. If you want to stop, just say so. No judgment. For real. Madison had a premonition of what would happen if they stopped now. They'd keep drinking and talking about what Hank's summoned ghost might do to them. Maybe they'd resolve to try the seance again, for real this time. But by then, they'd be drunker and tired. It would be a sloppy, anticlimactic exercise. If one day, Madison were to tell her children, her friends, her customers at the board game cafe the story of this night, She wanted it to be exciting all the way to the end. Hank Jones, Madison encanted. Are we welcome in your home? Hell yeah, Zan said. Good one, Maddie, Kelly said, then cut the deck into thirds and lay each face down on the ottoman. To get clarity on that, I think we'll do the past, present, future draw. As I flip each card, Hank's spiritual force will intervene to tell you what past events still affect you, what your present challenges are, and what direction things are headed. Hopefully that'll answer your question. Hopefully he doesn't just blow the roof off and slit our throats with the cards, Peter said. Kelly ignored Peter and flipped the first card, which showed six swords standing hilt up in a boat, along with a hooded woman sitting with her child, their backs facing the viewer. The image was done in the flat, representational style of the Middle Ages, but Madison could tell it had been designed recently by an artist who couldn't unlearn their lessons in sophisticated perspective drawing. The Six of Swords, Kelly continued, is about transition, leaving something behind for the promise of something better. The swords themselves represent Rational decision-making, a key weapon in your journey to contentment. Well, that's a little on the nose, Talia said. Madison laughed, suddenly aware that all her talk about moving to Hiram must have sounded like the measured ravings of a type A mastermind. 
Talia's quip didn't feel judgmental, though. She must have found this quirk of Madison to be endearing. So if Madison's the hooded woman, does that make Sasha the baby? Peter blurted. Dude, you're boning your mom. The woman wears a hood, Kelly said ominously, to conceal her identity, perhaps because she's fleeing something. Whoa, Zan said. With her eyes fixed on the swords, Madison swallowed hard. She and Sasha hadn't moved up to Hiram under duress. She wasn't fleeing, but she had been concealing her identity as best she could. Sure, the whole point of keeping spreadsheets had been to gradually reveal herself, to folks like Jer, at least. She couldn't hide who she was from Travis, or Mr. Travis. She might have, to some extent, during her first visit to the store. Not after today, though. Had she moved to flee her friends? Madison pressed the backs of her hands to her cheeks. Maybe it was less the tarot and more the Malbec, but she couldn't believe she was thinking it. Kelly had summoned Hank's ghost, and he fucking saw her. But could she see him? She knew enough about tarot to know that every card had an upright interpretation and a reverse one, depending on which way it faced when drawn. If Hank was speaking to her through Kelly, she wondered if the card faced him upside down. What's the reverse interpretation? She asked. Kelly gave her a knowing smile. This girl gets it, Kelly said. So, the reverse Six of Swords means you keep returning to the past because you're resistant to change. Sounds like, Sasha said, then clapped his hand over his mouth. He always did that when he caught himself interrupting. If you draw the reverse Six of Swords, Kelly continued with a slight nod towards Sasha, maybe you have trouble letting go of the past. Maybe you have trouble letting go of what others might consider junk. Like eagles? Zan said, seemingly stunned. Oh, shit, Peter shouted, sloshing wine onto his hand. Like eagles, Kelly said. Or perhaps you need to make a big transition, but you find yourself unable to make it happen. Was Hank's spirit trapped in the corporeal realm? There was something to the idea, Madison thought. Maybe their fates being flip sides of a tarot card meant that Hank could only be freed when Madison stopped hiding who she was in his house, in his airy, in his town. A flash of lightning lit the room like a strobe light. No one spoke. Sasha squinted at the window behind Kelly until a rumble of thunder drowned out the sounds of the rain. Nine seconds, Sasha said. Lightning's just under two miles away. Holy shit, Talia said as she squeezed Peter, who sloshed yet more wine onto his hand. Careful, babe. If y'all want to stop, seriously, we can, Kelly said. Madison downed the rest of her glass of Malbec and poured herself another. Nah. Next card. Kelly flipped the second card. It was met with stunned silence. Even the storm seemed to take a pause. Kelly issued a high, breathy, um, which prompted Zan, ever responsible for keeping the mood light, to let out a low. <whistles> Sasha began laughing through his nose, his, this is so fucked up, laugh. On the card, the dead were rising from their graves. A blonde angel hovered in the sky with a trumpet blaring downward towards them. The card faced Hank's ghost upright. Ah, uh, if we're expecting company, Zan said, slipping into a prim British accent. Shall I put on a pot of tea then? So, Kelly said, while it's fairly obvious that the upright judgment card means old Hank's gonna rise from the dead and murder us tonight. Agreed, Zan said. Was nice knowing y'all, Peter said. The reverse judgment means you haven't taken responsibility for your own actions, and you haven't learned the lessons you need to in order to thrive. 
this lack of awareness may be grating on those closest to you. Are you communicating well? Or do you find you're always shifting blame onto others? Madison swigged more wine. She had been shifting blame onto others. She'd blamed her friends for how they behaved in town, but she hadn't told them she was trying to make a good impression. How were they supposed to know? She hadn't told her friends to stop being jerks because, well, she was scared to. She was scared they'd think she was changing, that one day they'd come to visit and not only would Madison have gotten a basic girl haircut from Pam's unisex salon, but that she'd be a basic girl. Just as she'd wanted to control the pace at which people like Jer got to know her, she'd wanted to control how her friends saw her change. She needed to be more authentic. That's what the card was saying. More authentic and less calculating. It was time to scrap the spreadsheets, she thought. Time to tell her friends to be nice to Jer and for her to show Jer her true identity. Remove the hood. Kel, that's actually really helpful, Madison said. Okay, but too bad we're all going to die tonight before you get a chance to thrive, Peter said. He hadn't even looked at Madison when he said it. This is so fun, Madison said with a forceful exhale. After I'm done, why don't we crack another bottle and play again? Want to go next, Tolly? With the focus on Talia, a drunken Peter would embarrass himself fine for attention. And now, Kelly bellowed before Talia could respond. For the third card. Drum roll, please. With this cue, the group began slapping on all available surfaces, from the floor to their laps to the ottoman, rocking the candles like boats on rough seas. Kelly flipped the card. A flash of lightning briefly animated it. A hand emerging from clouds raised a sword straight up in the air. A crown balanced on the tip of the blade and wreaths festooned the crown. The card faced Madison upright. This, Kelly said, is the Ace of Swords. Three seconds, Sasha said. Storm's about a half mile away. Just like with any ace, Kelly said with authority, the ace of swords tells you that you're on the verge of experiencing a breakthrough. This sword is sharp enough to cut through the uncertain fog. Then you'll see the world as a place full of possibility and new beginnings. As Kelly spoke, Madison stared past her out the window. Lightning was flashing more frequently now, illuminating the driveway and carport. The Ace of Swords validated everything Madison had learned from the earlier cards. From now on, she would be more authentic. Tonight would be the night she took Peter down. Tomorrow, she'd talk to her friends about how they'd acted in Hiram. Next week, she might even get her hair cut at Pam's unisex salon. It was time for new beginnings. It was also time to ask the junk removal service to get rid of that last hideous carport. Of course, Kelly continued, bringing Madison back to the living room. The sword's double edge means that the wielder also has the power to deal destruction. Madison laughed. (laughs) Sorry, Peter. So what's it mean in reverse? Talia asked. The reverse Ace of Swords can symbolize a failure to communicate. Clashing perspectives. Without some kindness, confrontations can quickly become fights. You hear that, Hank? Zan hollered. If you're butt hurt about us being in your house, let's talk it out, buddy. Yeah, Hank, Peter said, practically shouting. This is a safe space. Madison smiled as she resumed staring out the window, letting Peter's words bounce off her like rain off the carport's roof. At the height of a lightning flash, she could almost make out the imprint where the last eagle had been crucified to the rafter. Was she welcome in Hank Jones' home? It was no longer his home. The eagle was gone now and wasn't coming back. 
She could neutralize men like Peter. She could erase men like Hank Jones and all his errs entirely. When the carport was illuminated again, the shadow of a figure had appeared below the rafter. She chuckled to herself. She and Sasha had spent so much time building Hank's ghost up, she couldn't expect herself to abandon the fantasy so readily. Peter spilled his glass of Malbec, and as the group began to collapse into apology, consolation, and tracking down paper towels in the dark, Madison got up and approached the window. The next lightning flash revealed the same shadow in the same place. She wondered if she'd interpreted the last card wrong. What if the breakthrough she was on the verge of was finally meeting Hank's ghost? The shadow wasn't a figure. It was a man, ankle deep in a puddle. The lightning reflected off the rifle in his hands and the bronze eagle on his belt buckle. Travis, or Mr. Travis, approached the window and raised his gun. The Ghost of Hank Jones was written by Charlie Kasoff, narrated by Caitlin Bailey, edited by Mallory Basic, sound engineered by Marie Cecile Anderson. To read more of Charlie's work, support him on Patreon. You can find more at patreon.com slash charliekasoff.